the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. In the previous episode, you remember, though the flower boat which was smuggling Marsha Winfield away from her friends was searched by Clinton Barney, no trace of the girl could be found. Instead, the two members of the secret police almost lost their lives, but Speed Gibson arrived in time to prevent this. After the crew and members of the octopus have been arrested and started back to Hong Kong under the supervision of Lee Ying, the Hong Kong operator of the International Secret Police, Speed, Clint, and Barney go to the house of Bob Gilmore, who shared the adventure on the flower boat. He has already told them that Marsha's brother, Larry, was his best friend, and is about to go into more detail when the voice of the octopus comes in over his short wave set, warning Bob to be silent, to forget what he knows about Larry Winfield, that Marsha's life depends on his bad memory. This silences Bob, and the boys begin to wonder if he can help them after all. Gee, Bob, the octopus gives warnings like that all the time. We don't pay any attention to him anymore. Nah, talk's cheap. Only time I start worrying about the octopus is when he goes into action. But, Barney, that girl's life depends on me now. If it was just my life, I wouldn't hesitate. But now, oh, I don't know what to do. Now, listen, Bob, I was up against the same thing a while ago when Marsha first disappeared. The octopus told me the same thing he told you. That I'd never see her again if I continued the search for him. You mean he's holding her as a hostage? Yes, and Marsha's fate is determined this minute whether you tell us what you know or not. Uh, but before I go any further, are you sure that short wave set is dead now? Yes, I checked it thoroughly after the octopus signed off. It was open before. Must have forgotten to turn it off when the flower boat came into sight. All the excitement and so forth. Yeah, that so forth business almost sank us. Uh, as I was saying, uh, the octopus knew what he was going to do with Marsha before he ordered his men to kidnap her. All his activities are carefully planned ahead of time. Of course, he was ready for a last-minute emergency. Like but... taking Miss Martian, the cargo of opium, off the flower boat, while you, Barney, and Bob are below with the captain, Clint? Yes, you see, his men are well-trained. They have orders and counter-orders, just in case the first plan falls through. Now, the only way we can hope to trace Marsha is to learn more of the background of the whole case. And uh, that's where you come in, Bob. By telling us everything you know of her brother. But there's little more to tell you than what I've already told you, Clint. All right, go ahead, Bob. Well, as I was saying, Larry got me a position with another company, but all the while he was talking me up to Mr. Merritt, president of the oil company he was working for, telling him that I was the man he wanted as his assistant on the Tibet expedition. Yeah, Miss Marsha said he was all excited about his job. He was, Speed. But that was his nature, enthusiastic about everything. That's why I noticed the change so much. What change? One evening, I had dinner with him and planned to meet him at his office next morning. He had some sort of a date that night at a private nightclub in Hong Kong that he was looking forward to. Wanted me to join him, but I couldn't afford it and wouldn't allow Larry to stand for my share. He was generous to a fault and... Uh... Uh, go on, Bob. Well, when I saw him the next day, I, I hardly knew him. He seemed dazed, under a spell. I asked him what sort of a time he'd had the night before, and, and he stared at me. Seemed about to speak and then shook his head. He wouldn't tell me anything, but from that day on, Larry Winfield was a changed man. He seemed to be living in a shadow, in dread of some impending doom. He tried to win his confidence, but it was in vain. He began avoiding me, and at last I had a brief note from him saying that he was going on a journey, and that's the last I ever heard from him. Now, I see. Uh, when did the Merritt Oil Company close its doors? About a month after that. Is Mr. Merritt still in China? No, I believe he went to England. His home was there. Gee, that doesn't help as much, does it, Clint? No, and yet Bob's information must contain some clue to Larry's whereabouts. Some tiny key that might unlock the whole mystery. Else, why did the octopus bother to warn him to keep silent? That's right. Oh, gosh, I'm tired. 
Me too, Barney. Oh, this has been a pretty strenuous day for all of us. I think we've accomplished as much as we can tonight. How about calling it a day, huh, and getting some sleep? Fine with me, Clint. I can't offer you anything better than cots, but I don't think they'll interfere with your sleep. Say, Bob, nothing could interfere with my sleep. Not even if I was to hang from a tree by my toes. <laughs> oh, good night, all. Good night, all. Good night, good night. Good night. Good night. Bob, you're a magician, fixing up our plane like this in no time at all, ripping out one of them gas tanks and fixing up another passenger seat. <laughs> it's pretty rough work, Barney, but it'll hold together until you get it back to Hong Kong for the finishing touches. Gee, it's swell that I can fly with Clint and Barney now. Well, I don't know if it is or not. But you get into more trouble when you're not with me than when you're with me, Speed. <laughs> oh, I guess it's all right. Oh, have you checked our short wave set yet, Bob? Yes, yeah, working all right this morning. Can't find anything wrong. Hmm? That's funny. I'll say. We couldn't raise a thing on it in the air. That is nothing but the octopus. I wish I had his evident knowledge of high frequency sets. He seems to be able to do anything he wants with the wave bands. Has anybody seen the monkey wrench? Oh, the, the houseboy borrowed it. Remember? Want me to go get it, Barney? Yeah, would you mind? Not at all. I'll be right back. What do you want with a monkey wrench, Barney? Nothing. I just wanted to get rid of Bob for a few minutes so we could talk. Yeah, that's a good idea. This is the first chance we've had to discuss the idea of swearing Bob in as a member of the secret police. Well, you have to do that, Clint? Well, if he's to work with us at all, yes, Phil. As you know, I cabled Chief Riley the latest developments in the case last night. And also asked him to send me all possible details concerning Bob Gilmore. Did you get an answer? Yes, I did. That was that little stroll I took this morning. Uh, Chief Riley cabled that Gilmore's reputation was okay when he left the United States. The particulars tallied with Bob's story in every detail. And you'll swear him in, Clint? Yes, the chief told me to do as I saw fit. And I think we're going to need a man like Gilmore before we're through with this case. That's all I wanted to know. Then we won't have to make double talk about Lee Ying being a tea merchant and so on. We can read him the cards as they fall. Yes. Will he come to Hong Kong then, Clint? No, not immediately. Bob may be of more service to us up here on the river than in Hong Kong. If he goes on as before, to all appearances, a young engineer, taking whatever work may come his way, he may hear something. But all the time, he can be working on a new plan of mine. What new plan? A survey of Tibet. Tibet? Then we're really going there? Uh, I don't know, Speed. But I want a good lay of the land in case we need it in a hurry. You mean we're going to Tibet after Larry Winfield? No, no, I'm not sure that we'll go there at all, Barney. But if the trail gets too hot, the octopus may leave Hong Kong. And I've got a hunch he has another hideout somewhere in Tibet. Well, now, let's see. Are we all through here? For the time being. Well, all right, then. Let's go up to the house, then, and swear Bob into the secret police. Are you sure he's all right, Clint? Huh? Why, of course he's all right. After all he's done, I don't see how you could possibly be suspicious of him. Besides, we have Chief Riley's okay, too. Don't forget that. Bob? Bob, where are you? Here I am, Pete. Still looking for the monkey wrench. My house boy has disappeared, and so is the wrench. Let that go, Bob. We got something more important for you. Yeah? What is it? Anything happened to the plane while I was gone? No, she's as good as new now. In a little while, we'll take off and stop bothering you. Oh, gee, it's been no bother, Barney. I'll be darn sorry to see you fellas leave. It's been a breath of home knowing you. <laughs> we'll keep in touch with you, Bob, because you're going to join our organization. Well, that is, if you wish. You mean... Join the secret police? That's right. Then I'll swear you in right now if you want, Bob. If I want? Do you know what this means to me? Sure, we know, buddy. And it's going to be the sort of work you like best, too. Engineering. <laughs> uh, suppose we swear Bob in uh, before telling him all, huh, Barney? Well, all right, go ahead. All uh, right. Uh, raise your right hand, Bob. Okay. And listen carefully. If you want to change your mind after hearing the oath, well, that's your privilege. I'm ready, Clint. Go ahead. Do you... Bob Gilmore, as a member of the International Secret Police, promise to obey and protect law and order in your own country or wherever else your duties may carry you? Will you cooperate with the foreign police after you have fulfilled your mission? And will you, above all else, recognize the code of the secret police? Courage, honor, and silence. And not betray it in any manner whatsoever. I promise. 
Congratulations. We got you into trouble already, Bob, so we thought you might as well have the name as well as play the game. See, this is one of the biggest moments of my life, fellas. What do I do first? Well, first, you will memorize this copy of our secret police code. And after you have it memorized, destroy the copy. I'm to stay here, then? Yes. After I return to Hong Kong, I'll wire you further instructions uh, in code. And that's why it's important that you memorize the code key. Uh, what about my short wave set? Well, the octopus will probably be listening to everything you send or receive over your set, Bob. He may suspect the wires, but he'll not be able to decipher them. Our code is the one thing we've kept from him. They've tried to get it often enough. You'll have to be extra careful, Bob. Don't let anyone know that you're in the secret police. Because after you do, the octopus will do anything to get rid of you. Yeah, and he kind of has it in for you now. <laughs> Don't worry about me. This is the sort of thing I like. I've been in plenty of tough scrapes before and have always managed to squeeze out of them. Oh, say, Bob. Yes? In the secret police work, sometimes too much courage is worse than too little. Oh, what do you mean? Uh, don't be too willing to die for the service. You will be able to help it more by continuing to live. In plain words, he means don't take unnecessary chances, Bob. Well, I understand. You'll have plenty to do, Bob, when Clint sends you instructions about surveying Tibet. Tibet? Yes, do you remember anything of Larry Winfield's work along this line? No, he stayed more to generalities. In fact, things were too much in the formative stage to have any detailed data. That was to have come later. Dr. Kingsley could help us out a lot on Tibet, couldn't he, Clint? Yes, and Li Ying, too. Oh, see, by the way, Bob, Li Ying is not only a tea merchant, but our Far East operator as well. No. Say, I don't see how the octopus is going to stand a chance against your organization, Clint. There are secret police everywhere. And there are octopus guys everywhere, too. Don't forget that. I'll say, for all we know, there may be some on that river out there right now. Hey, isn't that your houseboy down by our plane, Bob? Down by the plane... It is. What's he doing down there? Say, he's got a monkey wrench in his hand. The one we was looking for. Clint, he's going to wreck the controls. Quick, let's get down there and stop him. Uh, 